Why save an old barn? This young man asked that question 25 years ago. So I'm going to talk a little bit about round barns to begin with, and then we're going to talk about the actual farmer, Joshua Seacrest, followed by the carpenter, the barn builder, Frank Longerbeam. And then we'll focus on the Seacrest 1883 octagonal barn, one of the treasures of Johnson County, Iowa. We'll talk about the restoration and all the support that I've had for many, many years from many, many wonderful people. And then we'll come back to that question again. Why should we save barns? So round barns, you might not actually appreciate how far back round barns go and who one of the famous American farmers are that actually had a round barn. His name was George Washington. And George Washington actually has a round barn, or had a round barn. Uh, it is in uh, Mount Vernon, just outside of Washington, DC. You can see he's quite a proud farmer here. Um, this is a photograph from about 1870 of that round barn that was built in 1794. And unfortunately, it eventually fell down. But it was actually restored by an engineer from Iowa. And I got a personal tour of the round barn, 16-sided, uh, a week after it was uh, open to the public. Um, there's another famous barn. This is about two hours west of Boston. It's a shaker barn called the Hancock Shaker Round Barn. And this is a picture of the barn after it was completed in 1826. Um, this is another shaker, kind of. That's actually me in an early visit uh, when I was exploring some of the round barns around the country. So go back to Joshua Seacrest now a farmer, and born in 1866, when he left home at 19 years of age to work on the Miami Canal. He moved from Ohio in 1868 and moved to Iowa, got married in 1873, and bought the property that I'm going to focus on in 1875. He farmed until 1893 and died in Iowa City he lived in Iowa City the last part of his life and died in 1911. Frank Longerbeam was the barn builder, and of course that's a wonderful name for a barn builder, Longerbeam. He was also born in Ohio in Morgan County. His mother died when he was 10 years of age, and he moved to Iowa with his grandparents and in 1872 had a house in Downey. In 1878, I found an advertisement for him as a carpenter. And one of the stories that was passed down was that if a carpenter put in three nails, Frank Longerbeam would put in five. He also went uh, later in his life to invited to build the property for his family, uh, I guess a grandson or something. And he went over to the property near West Branch, and the wood was already laid out in front of the, the land. And Frank looked at the wood and said, I'm not building this house. If I build something, I pick out the wood myself. Another story that was passed down. So he teamed up with Joshua Seacrest and designed this house around the kitchen table on the farmstead in 1883 and built it at the age of 32. In, 18, in 1910, he's still listed as a carpenter in the local newspaper and died in the town of Downey in 1918. A photograph that was passed on to me, and there's Frank Longerbeam um, living in Downey around 1900. This is the town of Downey as it was laid out in 1872. Now, it turns out that there are not very many more houses in Downey than there are at this time, but the person that did this uh, business directory 
had a wonderful opportunity here, wonderful imagination perhaps, because uh, he was planning on having it a full-size house, a full-size city. And of course, because it was on the train tracks from Muscatine to Iowa City, it had the potential to grow having a train going through the town. And that's in fact cattle and shipped his, his cattle back to Chicago. So these were the houses back in 1872 in the town of Downey. This house right here turns out to be the house that Frank Longer being built. This is a view um, of Downey, and I like this because it has the train tracks in the front. And this is the big metropolis of Downey. This is the um, merchandise store that's probably sold everything. There's a way scale over here. And this right here is the new bank that went up in Downey. Now, they ordered a, a, a new safe from Chicago, likely. And the safe showed up on the train tracks, a big, heavy safe. How would you get the safe to the bank across the street? Well, the answer is, Here's the train tracks. Here's the bank. You built the platform. There's the train. There's the safe. There's like three or four different levels of the platform. And you move the platform along and ship it piece by piece and roll it right in the front window of the bank. Isn't that clever? And there's the safe, safe and sound in the Downey Savings Bank. Uh, the Downey Savings Bank is still there. It's been restored, and it's in pretty good shape. There's the window right there. So um, this is the shot again of the um, uh, across from the train station. And I always say this is probably longer beam right there. And I say that because he's big and strong, and his boots are all dirty. So he's probably the, the carpenter right there on the end. This is the house that Frank Longer being built. Now, if you can imagine, there's this before you could have a lot of newspapers. You didn't have uh, internet access to look at and advertise your skills. So one way of, of advertising your skills as a carpenter was to build your house that looked wonderful and it was in great shape. And that's what Frank Longer Beam did. So this is the Longer Beam family passed on to me by the, by the descendants. When I showed up in West Branch and down, this is what the house looked like. So it had been abandoned uh, for many, many years, and it was a mess. And probably about five or six years later, this is what the property looked like. Now, there's an interesting part of this is that nobody will ever know, for the most part, nobody will ever remember that that wonderful building on the corner of that town of Downey was there. It's gone. And it's probably gone from memory for maybe everybody. So that's one of the things we have to think about in saving our history. I want to go back to the town of Downey. So again, there's, I don't know, 30 or 40 houses here. So when I first started this project, I thought, well, it would be fun to have a town picnic. I was having restoration days, and the public was coming out on the weekends to help. And uh, I thought, well, gee, it would be nice to have a town picnic and share the condition of the barn with the people from Downey. So I asked around in the, uh, in the town and said, who is, uh, you know, is anybody in charge here? How, who should I ask? And there's no, there's no mayor or mayoress or anything. But they all said, if you go to that house on the corner, that woman is kind of in charge. So I walked up to the house, and I knocked on the door. And I said, hi, I'm Rich Tyler. I'm the one that's restoring the barn out of town. And she said, yes, I know. And I said, well, I would like to have a town picnic and invite everybody out to the barn. And would you be, well, I think that's a good idea. Would you be willing to help? And she said, I'll think about it. So I said, OK. So I came back a week later. 
And uh, she was enthusiastic. She was very helpful. She wanted to help all the, all the way around. So I said, OK, about how many people, how many people live in Downey, approximately? And she said, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And she counted every single person in every single house. And there were 87 people living in Downey on that day. And that's how we got the party going. And it was actually a wonderful party. So where did Joshua Seacrest get the idea and Frank Longerbeam to build this unique barn? There's no barn like this anywhere in the world. Where did they get the idea to do this? Well, it turns out that there was a guy named Benjamin Hershey who owned a lumber yard on the Mississippi River in Muscatine. And he was quite successful. He, at some point later in time, I think he was the mayor of Muscatine. And I found in a newspaper in Chicago that the barn that he built was reported, a barn in Muscatine, in the Chicago newspaper because it was so unique. And what Benjamin Hershey did was he hired an engineer from Baltimore who came out and designed this barn. So his dairy barn was built in 1878. And it was the first of, the, of its kind, reported in the Chicago newspaper, had laminated ribs, which I'll show you in a minute, and what they referred to as the Gothic arch. And again, we're going to see that in a minute as well. So first of all, I'll say that the wood for the barn probably came down the Mississippi, probably uh, lumber from Minnesota or Wisconsin up north. They would often build these little, um, build these little, uh, rafts um, and to float down, but sometimes they just float down the, the logs. And that would end up at the Benjamin Hershey uh, lumber yard. And that's where Frank Longerbeam would go and buy his lumber with a horse and wagon. And Frank Longerbeam probably saw this barn that Benjamin Hershey had built. It's obviously a rectangular barn built in 1878. But note the roof. So it's not a round roof, or it's not two square edges. It's actually got a bell shape to it. So this is the barn that Benjamin Hershey built in 1878. This is the inside of that barn. And the inside of that barn has these laminations. It's several layers of wood all nailed together. That's how they make this curve. So here's what the barn looked like in 1946. And I found this um, in a library, actually, um, north of Des Moines. And so it eventually um, became de decrepit, eventually fell down and disappeared. OK. And the people in Muscatine probably don't know that unique barn ever existed again, either. So let's go back to 1883 now. and. There were some pretty good things happening in 1883. It was a pretty special time. One of the things was the very first skyscraper was built. This was from Chicago. The very first skyscraper was completed in 1883. The other interesting thing that motivated me to visit New York City was the Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883. And I actually read the history of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge which was a complete nightmare and a disaster, but it was finally completed in 1883. And I have walked across the Brooklyn Bridge a few times um, just because it was built in 1883. OK, so in Downey, Iowa, 1883, Joshua Seacrest and Frank Longerbeam sit around the kitchen table of the Longerbeam, of the uh, Joshua Seacrest house and designed this barn. So I'm looking in the, in the newspapers in the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library archives. And lo and behold, I find in the local record, which the newspaper was called back then, this article. Joshua Seacrest, a thriving farmer living one and a half miles west of Downey, finishing off a barn, the largest building of its kind in the country, 75 feet high, stable room for 32 horses and 16 cows. And we'll kind of see them later on as well. 
200 tons of loose hay. That's about the weight of 200 small cars. And I haven't found the, all the modern conveniences that has mentioned there, the improvements that they mentioned in this 1883 article, but the barn is doing quite well. So there's not much written about barn building in general, and so this is our assumptions for the stages that they went through to actually build this barn. So they probably dug a little trench, filled it up with water, and they had these one by sixes and one by eights that they soaked in the water. They put in these uh, pieces of wood in the ground and then bent one around the uh, pieces of wood, hammered them through with square nails, put on the next one, put on the next one, put on the next one, and they built this huge arch. Okay, So that's the first stage in building this barn. Then what they're going to do next is they're going to build the foundation and they're going to put in the floor and then they've got a big arch like this on the ground and they're going to pull it up with horses. It's like a big McDonald's arch that's being pulled up straight. Okay? And they get it in place and it sits into the block of wood and this is the bottom of that um, laminated uh, wood the arch, and they've actually cut out a little hole in that block for it to slip into and to hold it in place. So then they've got the first arch up and they're going to put up the other ones one at a time. Okay, So here's one going up here, and one guy is sitting up on the top, and he's got a hammer and a bag of square nails. Does anybody volunteer for that job? Okay. So uh, horses involved, but not a lot of fancy tools and machinery like you have today. So here's the outside after they've got the eight different ribs in place. And this is uh, designed kind of like a bird cage. And actually, a structural engineer referred that to me. That's how it was built. So here is the uh, shot when we started the restoration by the Van Winkle Jacob Engineering Company, who are incredibly helpful in building this. So here's the lamination going up as a cross-section. The, the first level that went up, which was the basement for the um, horses and cows, this is where the horses came in with a wagon to unload the hay. There were four hay chutes, and this is the upper level used to for the 200 tons of loose hay. So quite a clever strategy here, a bank barn um, built in 1883. Um, so lo and behold, I'm in the Iowa City Public Library and looking at the history of Johnson County, and I find this picture from 1893. And there is indeed the round barn. Uh, this is probably Joshua Seacrest, one of these guys over here. This is the farmhouse that's there now, although one section of the farmhouse is not, there, not, not built yet. Um, but this is the road, and this is the farmstead, and uh, this is where the, um, the barn was built, and it's quite functional in 1893. So Frank Longerbeam, the carpenter, there was no school he had to go to. He probably learned from some a friend or, uh, or an uncle or learn perhaps some in some farming newspaper, but a lot of this stuff was self-taught. So I want to show you this joint right here. So this is called a bladed scarf joint. So some of the joints that were made were kind of like this, and that um, a, a lap joint. And the problem with the lap joint is as they dried out, sometimes they would twist like that and, and separate. And so this was a, a little more clever. This was a bladed scarf joint that went in like this so it can't twist. So this was a very clever strategy for Frank Longerbeam to do this. But without being too critical, Frank Longerbeam made a mistake. Can anybody see where the mistake was? The mistake was where he put this post. So what happened in a few places in the barn is that because of the weight and the pressure from above, this part of the wood here split and this part came down because there was not much supporting this. 
So where should he have put the post? He should have put the post right under there. And he actually had to go in afterwards and make some modifications to accommodate that. Certainly, I should not criticize Frank Longerbeam. I'm putting this out, pointing this out for uh, interest's sake only. So this is looking up from the floor of the barn, looking up at the top, where all these laminations and of uh, things come together. Uh, this is the uh, Hayfork carrier system um, going along uh, under the roof. This is one of the laminated ribs, which uh, was a very similar, if you can think back, of the barn that Frank Longerbeam would have seen in Muscatine when he went to pick up his wood. So it's most likely where he got, most definitely, I would say, where he got his idea to use this. I was also surprised to find a picture of the barn in 1918. And so here's the barn over there. And this is taken from across the street. The farmhouse is over there. Still several buildings and uh, an active farm. So by looking at the records, the government records and the tax records of the barn, I was able to find out a little bit more about what happened uh, during that period. And so, for example, in 1880, these are the acres that were planted in the different crops. So uh, it's recorded that he planted uh, almost 100 acres of Indian corn, also oats, wheat, flax, and barley. And this is the crops that he sold in 1880, 8,000 bushels of Indian corn. I'm not a farmer, so I don't know if that's a good yield or not, but that's what's in the records. So what happens later on? Well, as you know, the Great Depression arrives. Um, in 1900, Guy Seacrest took over. Joshua moved into town, into Iowa City. And it turns out that in 1934, there was a foreclosure, and the Seacrest family lost the property. And the state of Iowa took over and sold the property to R.J. Phelps, who was not a farmer at all, didn't live there, for $19,000. In looking at the uh, Depression, I found a few interesting things. And one of the things with these auctions I discovered was that there were often auctions for farms like this that were lost but all the community was very supportive of the farmer. So you'd have a large group of people go out to the auction, and the auctioneer would try and sell the farm, and the highest bid was a penny. And they called these penny auctions in the Midwest because the neighborhood didn't think it was fair to sell this farm um, just because the problems of the Depression had arose. So it's also interesting to see what happened to the size of the, of the farmstead over time. This is when Joshua Seacrest bought it, about 150 acres, increased in size to about 1,900, over 500 acres. His son took over and he lost it in 1935, I believe. Now, I also found uh, the mortgage record of the farmstead. And this is the debt. Now, they went up during the Depression, but the interesting thing was when they, got, when they foreclosed on the property, um, the Seacrest family had actually done a pretty good job in reducing the debt. And so it's not clear why the banks foreclosed. I guess they owed money to this other person. It's quite complicated, but it looks like that the Seacrest family, Guy Seacrest, was doing okay. Not okay enough, apparently. Okay, now we're going to go back into the restoration phase. So many, many years later, 1992, the farm is overgrown, uh, had been used for hogs for many years. The owner did not live there. The house was rented out and decrepit and had been abandoned for a while and vandalized. So I went over, and this is what the, house looked, the, the, the barn looked like in 1992. Uh, it was white, it was falling over, uh, there was holes in the roof, um, overgrown. Uh, you can also see, interestingly, on the sides here, you see the curves? So the, the ribs were bowed out 
because of the compressive load from the roof. Okay. Uh, a view of the cupola. And looking from the middle of the barn, looking up. And these are not stars from a Walt Disney movie. This is holes in the roof. That's what you're seeing up there as you look up. Um, again, there's various holes, wood shingles. Um, and this is the amazing set of stairs that Frank Longerbeam built that hangs from the ceiling. So there's no way of falling out of the side from these stairs, but of course the whole stairs could give way. So it took me a little time to build up enough courage to go up those stairs, but the roofing contractors that were coming out to give bids were going up like it was nothing to it. So eventually I got up enough courage and went up there and did it. And I still only go up there when I have to. Um, it's pretty scary. So this is the condition in the upper level. Um, had lots of loose hay. I found little containers with gasoline in them. There was just junk everywhere. The floor wasn't very solid. Um, uh, it was just loose hair. It had been abandoned and not used at all for years. Um, my sister came to visit from Canada, and she looked at this place and said, what the heck is this guy doing? What does he think he's up to now? And I didn't know, actually. <laughs> Okay, so the restoration. So um, I had grant support, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, Van Winkle and Jake came out and started off even before I had some grant support and were very enthusiastic in helping the project. So uh, part, of the, part of the problem was that this was all dirt here and it was pushing over the barn, as well as the compressive load of the roof was pushing down and bowing out the eight ribs of the barn, as they described it. So this is the uh, overall perspective. This is the uh, part of the plan was to put in um, uh, steel cables uh, from one edge to the other in the eight corners and pull them in to get rid of the bowing on the sides. So that was one important part of the restoration. Um, so these are some diagrams I had made to get things going to sort of see. And there's the, the roof, which is um, this bell-shaped thing. Um, this is my uh, diagram of the construction of the beams and the 8x6, eight 8x6, six, eight, eight six, eight inch tall posts on different levels. Um, and again, this is where they went into this block to attach themselves, and that had to be cleaned out. Um, the center post actually again was bowed out in the lamination. So there's that rib going down onto the floor. Uh, there is, it is after the restoration. So what they'd had to do was take this uh, new wood and put it around on the sides to clamp that after they pulled it in so it would uh, maintain the pressure from, the, from the coming down from the top. And here's where that uh, rib goes in here in the corner. Uh, this is a view from the outside of the barn. Um, and uh, they took off some corner boards. They put this as about a six foot tall piece of steel with uh, two sides on it. And they attached a steel cable, you'll see in a minute, to the opposite corner and then pulled those two in slowly to pull in the ribs. Um, and you can see the bottom here, what kind of condition that was in. So this is the, I said, the, the other problem was the barn was tilting over to one side. And so what they did was they put a, this uh, connection here, a little steel plate in the two corners to, to make it solid. And then they drilled a hole through the wall boards and put this steel cable all the way through the barn, outside the front of the barn, and buried a big concrete slab, attached it to the slab, and then tightened it up and pulled the barn up straight again. So a very clever strategy, saving the barn. This is the ribs that were pulled in, showing the connection there. And uh, this is the rib connecting going right underneath that top floor. 
and uh, gain some uh, diagrams that I made in that early stage of trying to know what to do next. Well, of course, a roof went on, had to be replaced. It was apparently, according to the people that told me that it, there had been two roofs on the barn already, it was a wooden shingled roof, and I had grant support from the State Historical Society, and so putting on an asphalt roof, which was all that could be afforded at the time, is considered a stabilization, not a restoration. So in the future, someone can come back in, take off the asphalt shingles, put on original wood shingles, and that would be a restoration. But in this process, the barn has been stabilized with the asphalt shingles. This is the um, scaffolding. Um, and when the uh, roofing contractors were very, very helpful, and they put the scaffolding up on one side of the barn and replaced the roof on that one side. When they had the roof, uh, when they had the scaffolding up, I went up, also with my son Jeffrey, and painted the barn with paintbrushes by hand. Now, I'd never been on scaffolding before, and I didn't think I could do it, but in any event, I had it. Now, I just want, this is a warning, don't look down. That's what it looks like from up there, right? So it took me a while, and I didn't look down. I just got my paintbrush out and painted the barn. Here's the inside of the barn, and here's that uh, uh, cable going through attached to this corner up over here. Um, the lamination now in good shape. Uh, this is the basement of the barn. You'll see uh, here one of the uh, beams uh, split, uh, again, because of where this post was. And uh, I was living in West Branch at the time, and my neighbor, Jim Racy, came over and jacked it up and fixed it, and no questions. He just wanted to help. Uh, this is what he did. So he designed this and built it himself. We put in some heavy glue in there and just uh, supported that cracked beam that way. This is the outside. It's, a, it's a, a, not a, a con square blocks or bricks. It's actually cobblestone, I think they refer to this. Um, and of course, all the pointing was not in great shape. And uh, part of the grant support was to repoint the edges. And uh, the volunteers did a great job. Um, so the barn was originally red. So I had to follow the Secretary of the Interior standards. I was using grant support from the state, so I had to paint it red. Now, all my friends in Downey, who had been to the picnic and had been out and seen the barn several times, were used to seeing the barn as a white barn. So when I painted it red, they didn't like that at all. But that was the original color. So the barn got painted red. And here is the scaffolding as it's moving along um, with the roof on and uh, the scaffolding done. This is the attached cattle feeding shed. This is on the north side of the barn. And uh, this was actually a very clever strategy where the hay up here could be dropped and stopped in the second floor and then moved off in a wooden train tracks and a train car in here to move hay out into here so the cattle could come in and get the hay instead of moving the hay out to the field. So it was a very clever strategy as well. This is the inside of that. So they had, uh, had these posts in the ground, and they were in the dirt when the thing was built, probably in about um, after 1883, probably 1890 or something. And they just put the posts in the dirt. And then later on, when they put concrete, they just poured the concrete over there. So anytime it got wet, anytime it rained, the water would just flow down to where a post was and go down into the hole where the wood was. And the wood doesn't like water, and it eventually rots, and this was sinking. So we actually jacked this up with um, jacks um, one section at a time, cut off the bottom of the post, filled up the hole with concrete, built a little concrete post out of a ice cream plastic container, poured concrete in there, put it down, and dropped the, um, dropped the wood back over that little uh, concrete post. Whoops. So um, 
This is a view of that wooden tracks that go from the barn out to the round tile silo, which, by the way, was uh, invented in Iowa, I understand. And uh, that's where they would feed the cattle. So part of the restoration was to save the round tile silo. Um, and this is the crew out there working on that. Fortunately, I didn't have to help with this at all. Um, this is not something that I would do. <laughs> Uh, but they did a great job and repointed the entire silo. Um, this is what I think the horse stalls look like. The horse stalls had been taken out in the basement um, for pigs in more recent years. But uh, I looked around and did some research, and that's what I think they look like. Um, I then, one of the stories I tell is I had planned on just having a stick horse to put on some of the... Um, paraphernalia that I had found or that had been given and donated to the barn. They were all little pieces of these horse uh, garb. And um, what I decided to do was, because I had a course at the Hoover Presidential Library on not trying to pretend you had something old if you really didn't. So I just thought, well, I'll make a stick outline of a horse, and then I'll just hang all these things over the top of it. So I had a tour from a, uh, a bunch of 12-year-olds, uh, and I'm showing them the picture of this horse that I had, this stick horse that I had made, that I was told them what I was going to do. And this 12-year-old girl looked at me, and she said, have you ever seen a horse before? <laughs> so I thought I'd actually better make something that looked like a horse. And so I uh, waited until the boss went out of town. I projected this on our conference room wall and traced it out and made a real horse, kind of. Uh, and of course, subsequently, in the basement, we also needed cows. And uh, I want you to pay attention down here, because this cow actually has udders. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So one of the nice things about this for me, over the many, many years, are the thousands and thousands of volunteers that I've met. People have been so helpful so friendly. People show up that are interested in barns, that are interested in barn hardware, that are painters, that are photographers. It's amazing. Uh, these groups have made an incredible contribution. Uh, Sigma Lambda Beta International from the University of Iowa, Phi Kappa Nu from Cornell, uh, our Redeemer Lutheran Church, the Upward Bound Project participated in many, for many years, and lots and lots and lots of people were just so helpful and continue to be helpful on the project. Uh, an example of cleaning some of the uh, concrete. Um, this is my daughter working on the walls on the outside. Um, these are some of the fraternity guys helping out. And some of these guys were from New York City and had never seen a barn before, and they were out there helping out. It was just fantastic. Uh, does anybody recognize, <laughs> anybody recognize this volunteer? So uh, in the early days, um, I was trying to, to drum up um, some interest, obviously, for volunteers and getting people to help. And uh, Governor Branstead came out. And in the front of the barn, I had two books for people to sign. I have a visitor's book, and I have a volunteer's book. And so I asked Governor Branstead which book he would like to sign. So he said he would sign the volunteer's book. So we marched outside, and this was a hog pen out here, and Governor Branstead helped shovel off some of the hog manure, dried for 15 years, into the wheelbarrow and dumped it out. So then this picture appeared in the West Branch newspaper. Thank you, Governor Branstead. So again, I've had wonderful grant support from the State Historical Society. Um, it's called the Historic Resource Development Program from the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, there are, by the way, for those of you interested in preservation, federal and state historic preservation tax incentives. I've also had some support from the Friends of Historic Preservation in Iowa City and eventually became uh, an Iowa Humanities Speakers Bureau, which is supporting this talk now. And so I go around the state uh, four or five times a year in some small town and give a talk about the barn. And it's a wonderful thing for me. People are very appreciative. 
and uh, part of my mission is to share this, which I enjoy. This is the website that I found recently uh, for, for the State Historical Society. I didn't even realize they had the barn uh, on their website, but that's great. So uh, there it is on their historical website. Um, after a year or two, it took me quite a while to find anybody to help this and to know what to do and what to do next and who was a contractor and stuff. And so once I got all this organized, I actually uh, also decided to give a class once a year. Uh, it was a one-day class um, through Kirkwood Community College. And so we actually gave this class in the barn, and we had several people help. Uh, Emily Roberts actually uh, owned uh, a round barn in Johnson County as well. And these people actually came out and talked um, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and we had classes of about 25 to 40 people come out from around the area, in Cedar Rapids and so on, just to, because they're interested in restoring their barns and their property, but it wasn't clear what to do and who to find and how to move forward. So this was a wonderful thing, and again, a way to communicate with these people and to, to, uh, to share this uh, knowledge and strategy with other people. Many of the people here were actually helped in the restoration of the Seacrest barn as well. So let's come to the end now. Why should we save a barn? Who cares? Well, one of the interesting things that's happened is we have all this history and all these tools. And lots of people had donated some tools. So I found some tools and some, of the, and some parts. This is a wooden shingle. And it turns out that the, the wooden shingles, every now and again I found one that said, Adnac Company, made by the Adnac Company. And as soon as I saw that, I knew exactly where it was from, Adnac. Adnac is Canada, spelled backwards. And I was born in Canada. So the, the shingles actually came from Vancouver, or from the area around Vancouver in British Columbia. There's some really interesting tools. You're welcome to come up and have a look later to see what some of the things happened. There's a really interesting corner chisel that I had never seen before. There's wooden pegs to communicate. If you put the nail in the wrong place and you want to take it out, there's a nail puller. And a screwdriver. But one of my favorite tools that I found, and again, the family lost the barn in the Great Depression. And I was told there was an auction. And when I bought the property, it was empty for the most part, full of junk. And I did find, hidden behind one of the pieces of wood in one of the corners, this screwdriver. Now it turns out that Herbert Hoover was living in West Branch when this barn was built. Herbert Hoover's father was a blacksmith. So I've teased the people at the Hoover Library for years that this was probably made by Herbert Hoover's father. I don't have any proof of that, but it's a good story anyways. This is a screwdriver, the only tool that I found on the property. So the history is important here. Um, there's also now accumulated lots of little tools. It's interesting to see the technology. And one of the interesting things about the technology in this age, in the 1800s, is if you were a farmer, you could see what was going on. Most of us are using computers every day, but we don't know how the computer works and we can't improve on the computer unless we know what's inside and how it all works together. When you were a farmer at this time, you were not only doing it and seeing how things worked, but you could see exactly how it worked. And there are a few farmers like John Deere that said, hey, I can make this better. It was an incredible age of invention. Um, lots of uh, wagons. This, I found this at an auction. This, uh, there's a wagon jack here as well. Um, there's been several parties in the barn. So the barn's a good place to have fun. Um, a rock and roll group, uh, dancing, 
dance lessons, square dancing in some places. Weddings, so people now have weddings in the barn. Isn't that a great wedding cake? Um, also, because of the cow that I showed you, it's all, I sometimes have farming events. And I should brag that I'm actually a certified in milking a cow. And I got this at the state fair in Minneapolis. And I have a certificate to prove it. Um, so in part of the, and there's me, learning how to officially uh, milk a cow. Um, so this is in the basement of the Seacrest Barn when I have some of the events out there. And these are some children that are actually learning how sort of to milk a cow. Okay. The barn is also used for chamber music. So uh, people have events out there. Nonprofit groups use it for free. Um, it's a great place to be. And uh, this is uh, some nice classical music that was performed in the barn uh, last year. And we also had some parties early on, still do. Uh, this is the shed, so it's not painted red yet. So this is early on. And this is my daughter. We had a pumpkin carving party at the barn. Uh, this is my daughter and son later on playing some music in the barn for a performance. Everybody's having a good time. Um, this is one of the farm demonstrations that I've had out there in the barn where people bring out some tractors, some old equipment to, to show off, and uh, the public comes in. I try and do this once a year, once every couple of years. Uh, one of the things we do is actually some guy used to come out on a regular basis and pull the hay up into the barn with a horse. So all the, all the strategy is still there. The barn's in great shape, and these kinds of things can still go on. There's the farmhouse in the background. There's the horse. And this is the hay fork carrier system that was original to the Seacrest 1883 octagonal barn. So um, I was able to contact my friend Pat, who eventually came out and drew a picture of the barn um, and the farmhouse. This is, of course, you know, P. Buckley Moss. Not really my friend, but she did come out and paint this. Um, and also, uh, I was notified by somebody that there was a gas station on Interstate 80, halfway to the Quad Cities, where there were some very special Christmas cards. And I went out, and sure enough, there was a special Christmas card with the uh, octagonal barn on the c cover. So of course, I bought three boxes. And then people have come out um, to take pictures of the barn. It's a wonderful place, as I said, for artists to come out, for ph photographers to come out. Uh, this man left his camera out all night long and got a pictures of the stars moving around the barn during the evening. Uh, it turns out, much to my surprise, the barn appeared on the front cover of the uh, West Liberty and West Branch telephone book. This is not a river, this is or a lake. This is actually the roof of a car, which I thought was kind of clever. Um, so also, just a couple years ago, it turns out that my friend Martha put it in her wedding magazine. And I actually didn't realize that, that at all. So somebody contacted me. And it's not really about the barn. It's about. Uh, a wedding by these, this couple up here. But uh, my friend Martha decided to put it in her magazine. So that was pretty cool, I thought. OK, so here's the barn. It's a great place. It's uh, nothing like it in the world. It's very unique. Um, it's a wonderful treat. And uh, it's been a lot of fun saving the barn, and I met lots of wonderful people, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to share it. So thank you very much. And, and I'm happy, happy to take questions. So yes. If, if Wayne oh. said, so if you have questions, part of preserving history is we're preserving this program as a historical record and to, to air on our library channel and then to stream off our website. So if you have questions, which I hope you do, I'm going to hand you the microphone so that the people at home watching it and the people in the future will know what your question is and won't have to guess from the answer. Hi, Rich. Um, when you brought in the eight beams with the cable, right. 
stretch it across. Did you use a turnbuckle? Yes. So system like you like we might see right. anywhere. So again, you might recall that the barn was bowed out in the side because of the compressive load of the roof. So what the contractors did is they built this three-sided, six-foot-tall uh, clamp on each side of the opposite uh, pieces of wood, and then they had a solid steel um, cable going between the two with some turnbuckles. And I actually uh, took a, a film of this, and I was told that they might do it uh, three or four times over two or three weeks because they didn't want to pull it in too fast. So I took a picture of it and it turns out that they pulled it in in about 25 seconds and I think I missed the whole thing because I was looking through a movie camera. Do you but recall they, how many inches it came yeah, in? Yeah, in some places it moved about nine inches. Rich, I really admire your work, and I was out there last summer for a party, and it was a fabulous. It was terrific, and uh, you explained to me, uh, I, I thought that those beams had been carved, but the laminations were explained. I have a very elemental question. Why would someone build a round barn mm -hmm. rather than a rectangular barn? It's obviously more difficult to, to construct. Right. So, um Round barns also came into play in the mid-1800s, and there were also lots of very interesting round houses. And one argument for the round barns is that it was more efficient. There, often the round barns had a, a silo in the middle, and the animals could face the, the center in a smaller round barn. There were also arguments that you could get more floor space for the same amount of lumber that was used. Probably the most convincing argument is that the winds would be deflected off the sides of the round barn, which of course is interesting considering the scheduled talk two weeks ago had to be postponed on the round barn because of high winds. But probably, I'm going to say, without trying to be too disrespectful, I'm going to guess that Joshua Sequest was very successful and maybe he was trying to show off just a little bit. Do we have any other questions? If not, I would really like to thank you, Rich. I've been out at the farm a couple times, and I grew up in Cedar County, so it's just a remarkable structure. And in the summertime, I've never been out there in the winter, but in the summertime, you just you get a feel for Iowa at its best, I think. So thank you very much. And I'm, people, please come up and take a look at the tools and continue yeah. to ask questions off camera if you'd prefer to do that. So thank you very much. You're welcome.